Hi, everybody. Welcome to Embody You Podcast. And this is Artemis. And I'm really excited today because I have a special guest, Marshall Bircher. Hi, Marshall. Hi. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. I've actually, I've had my eye on 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 what you've created for some months. And I've mm. just been kind of waiting, waiting for when it was like the right time to, to reach out. And so I'm really grateful that you said yes to come on and talk about codependency and self-trust because I think that is a major topic many people can relate to. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for the privilege. This is this is fun. So I'm love that I get a chance to share my my message and my work and make an impact in the people you're serving. So I really enjoy Perfect. that. Awesome. Okay, so let's I'm curious before we even hop into what codependency and self-trust is all, you know, about for listeners. What led you to to uh, focusing on your work with clients around that? Like, what's your my own work? I'm I'm a a recovered codependent. I grew up in a family that was a my mother was highly codependent and enmeshed with my father. He is a, a paranoid schizophrenic who is also a covert narcissist. So I grew up in this dynamic of of just basically a war zone of these, this tip for attacking between each other and trying to defend and all this stuff, the gaslighting and the, and the control tactics. And then she, she passed away when I was a child, uh, when I was 10. And then my father promptly remarried and brought in uh, uh, my stepmother, who was um, a highly traumatized individual who also demonstrated a lot of narcissistic and borderline personality disordered behaviors. Um, and so all, all I knew was I either please or I am invisible because when I, I'm, I'm an Aries, I'm a little fire sign. Mm -hmm. far. When that, when that would come out, there would be an instant um, correction as they would put it, but it would be a form of, for me, verbal, physical, uh, and sometimes, well, verbal and emotional and sometimes physical abuse uh, to get me back into the premise of that family dynamic, which was obedience. Mm -hmm. So codependency is all I knew growing mm -hmm. up. And um, that led me into a marriage where I became the aggressor. I became the abuser. And that woke me up. There was, I knew there was, this is not who I want to be. Mm -hmm. then uh, this is not right. And I was dealing with severe, a uh, severe panic disorder. I have panic attacks eight to, to 10 times a day. Um, a lot of suicidal ideation, a lot of depression because of my own trauma. And so around 2007, I had enough of it. And I was like, either this changes or I'm done. And so I, I started doing some of my own work because I've gone to therapy. I've done CBT, talk therapy. I've done the medication route. I even did meditation for the stuff. And these things were not, <laughs> they gave me coping skills. And I'm not a fan of coping because it's just living with it. Um, so in 2007, I started to just, hey, I'm going to try some different stuff. And that led me into connection with one of my first mentors. His name is Robert Wu. Duan, he is a Chinese shaman out of Aspen, Colorado. And he started teaching me these concepts that are known as today as somatic processing or somatic experiencing, nervous system regulation. And that actually started to have a big impact. I and mean, distinctly, four months after I started working with him, there was a day where I didn't have a panic attack. There was a day where I didn't have anxiety. And that was like a miracle to me. And this started to create enough space within my brain, my awareness, my nervous system to consider what else was going on in my marriage and stuff. And that's where I started to realize I have, I'm codependent. I am controlling. I am pleasing. I am fawning a lot to people. And there's all this contortion in me. And that started the journey into codependency. And then in 2012, it really 
came to a head for me because I, my ex-wife and I divorced and I was dating a different woman at the time. And she put it real clear. She's like, you have not done your work. I'm out. And the way she gave me that feedback woke me up to this, this factor in me that I, I never got in therapy. I didn't get in a book. I didn't get in a YouTube video. It just, Marshall, <laughs> how you're behaving and who you are are not congruent. Who do you want to be? And it was in this moment, it's February 4th, 2012, 1030 in the morning, <laughs> walking around my neighborhood. And that's where I made this decision. I need to figure out the difference between behavior and who I am and change this. And that opened up within eight months, this entire shift for me. And then I started teaching it to my clients because by that point in time, I'd gone through uh, certification and training with Robert Wuduan and another individual named Robert Bilton, and um, who was a relationship therapist at the time. He's since retired. And I started putting this into my clients' work and they're like, my world's changing. And it was changing quick. And that change stuck. And so I started going, I have something here that I think people need. And so that brings us to, to today. So a good 10 years later, here we are. That's how I got into it. I really appreciate you sharing your story in it as an introduction, because I think your story is many people's story, you know, of... Um, growing up in a toxic home environment with, you know, a family that has narcissist, narcissistic or borderline traits or any sort of trauma and violence and what ends up happening in these uh, survival patterns, right? These defense coping mechanisms of like you were sharing of uh, where you're placating and you're hiding and you're masquerading and you're, you just learn how to, um, yeah, you learn how to adapt based on the needs of others uh, since you never were safe enough to be yourself. And yeah, yeah so I, I really appreciated you um, sharing that and then kind of bringing it full circle of how, yeah, talk therapy definitely has its limitations. And yeah, I mean, nervous system regulation and somatic really does help support embodiment and addressing this issue of codependency. So let's, let's jump into what is, so what is your definition of codependency? Let's start there. And then I'll ask you self-trust afterwards. All right. Mine's a little different than what most people encounter out there in the world. Um, I look at codependency as a survival strategy. It, there, there's three things we all need from day one. And that is we need safety. We need connection and a sense of identity. And these three needs are going to be fulfilled in some fashion for the person to either survive or thrive. And in codependency, it attempts to feed these three needs by pleasing and appeasing others by playing invisible. I'm needless, don't have needs. Or if I do have needs, I'm going to covertly try to get them met through controlling others or fixing others, things like that. And then my sense of identity is defined by the perspective of the other person. I call that external orientation. The other person is defining my value, my personhood, my rights, my power. And so codependency does this because it's a biological response to a threat. Technically, we have four responses to threats, and that's we can fight it, we can flee from it, we can freeze and play dead or we can fawn. Codependency is a mix of freezing and fawning over and over and over. Sometimes some people have a fawn fight reflex, but the fawn component is the genesis of codependency or codependent behaviors. And it's all designed. The brain's brilliance here is it's trying to get those three. I'm trying to feel safe. I'm trying to feel connected, have secure attachment, and I'm trying to find out who I am. And it's, Codependency is the way the brain determined it could do that in unstable, chaotic, and dangerous uh, relationship dynamics. Yeah, I really love how you stressed the biological component, right? Because that helps really, I think, release a lot of shame around codependency in general. Um, yeah. I, from my experience, just 
and I'd be curious to hear your opinion, but my experience in, in the therapy world, yeah, codependency can be shamed a lot, you know, when it's actually more prevalent and common and, <laughs> and when you break it down in this biology and it's like, like you said, a survival, I like that you also stress that it really helps kind of normalize it a bit more and see how it's, you know, it's been trying to serve you in some way. It is trying to serve you. It's your brain's mm-hmm. brilliance trying to keep you alive because that's mm-hmm. its priority. It's going to keep you alive either through survival or through thriving. Well, if it can't thrive, it's going to survive and it's going to utilize what it can to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's a common, a lot of codependency is originally a genesis out of the Alcoholics Anonymous movement. Mm-hmm. And they use a disease model in their look, at, their perspective of addiction. So that's why there's a lot of shame around. It's why a lot of therapists, a lot of prominent people out there are like, eh, it's a disease. It's your identity. It's, it's who you are. You're just going to have to cope with it. And <clears throat> I don't agree. I, I look at when I, when I started looking at my codependent reflexes as a um, survival approach, like what am I trying to get here? What need am I trying to get? What safety, what connection, what identity? things started to make more sense because then what happened is codependency became a set of behaviors and not my identity. It became like, okay, I'm trying to get something I need here. What other ways can I get this met now? So my codependent impulses like pleasing, fixing, fawning, being invisible are now signals to me that I have a need and now I can implement a healthy approach to getting that need met rather than the codependent behavior. So that's why I call it a strategy rather than an identity, a disease, or a flaw in who we are, because it's none of those. This is how I transition people from codependency to a healthy interdependency, so that you don't need codependency anymore. You actually might need it at particular times, too. Like, you get yourself in a situation, or you find yourself in a situation with someone who's aggressive or abusive, fawning will get you out of it, and then you don't have to go back. So it's not something we need to replace, in my view. It's something we add to. And then we design our life in a way that we don't get into those situations as much or if at all, because you have a strong sense of self, a strong sense of personal boundary and definition. And then we're, we are attuned to trusting our own perception, our own internal signals, and then responding to those on our behalf rather than what makes them feel better. I love that you also mentioned, yeah, and like not putting yourself in those situations or environments, because I think that's key in recovering from codependency is kind of, you know, your old ways, you don't have to keep placing yourself in situations that are going to keep re-triggering you, your needs are not being met in all these factors. Yeah. Yeah. The part of the, I call it the the pivot and it's not an easy thing but we all have a responsibility we all come to a crossroads in our work in codependency where i did not know what i was doing i was surviving now i'm coming to understand what i'm doing which transitions us to responsibility for the use of our personal power the choice and actions we take when we take this ownership when we take it seriously we internalize it. it's like okay what am i choosing does this add to my well-being and happiness? And if the answer is no, then we don't choose it. So we restore power there. And that's not an easy step because we, we have parts that are victimized. We have parts that are hurting. We have parts that have learned to be helpless and hopeless. But our responsibility as the adult is to care for these parts by saying, no, we're not going there. That's going to create more pain. We're going to do the painful investment tomorrow's happiness by facing our internal pain rather than trying to avoid it by just getting into this seduction abuse discard loop again, uh, where we're just going through, you know, swings of euphoria, distress, and despair over and over and over. That's just, we're going to deal with our real pain. So Mm. I call that sobriety. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Not needing to get into that trauma bonding cycle, the highs and lows and yeah, definitely. Identify that intermittent reinforcement. When you see it, you get out. Right, right. It's all, no is an ally. I have this saying where your happiness is on the other side of no. 
when it mm-hmm. comes to codependence. I'm like, the more you say no, the more you have the space you have for the yeses that really matter to you. But it's gonna, it's gonna take work. Yeah. It's gonna be scary at first. But mm-hmm. with the right, with the right knowledge, the right tools, the right support at the right time, you're going to get through it. Mm-hmm. So and I think <laughs> there's to be said, and I'm sure. Yeah, I'm curious of what else you would add on around as a res- the nervous system, right, starts continue being, you know, like repaired and and regulated it, because there is that when you're used to so much trauma and stress, right, and chaos and and that a lot of that has to do with once you get more regulated and safe, it's like that's when you're able to really attune and not place yourself in those situations, but it takes it takes a while for your nervous system to even adjust. That's why if your nervous system is consistently dysregulated, it's normal for you to feel like it's, that's a normal for you too, in these environments yep. where it's activated. Yeah. You're talking about familiarity mm-hmm. to the nervous system. And actually <clears throat> when I work with codependence, especially in relationship development, Anything that feels familiar is a red flag. We start there because we need to examine it. So a nervous system's dysregulated state feels normal to us because that's all we've ever really known. We've not had, for many of us, we've not had a shelter where we were allowed to feel and to communicate that feeling and to let it be cared for and valued. So we didn't get co-regulation. And since we didn't get co-regulation, we didn't get internal regulation. So we live in this externally regulated state, which means whatever they feel determines how I feel. So this external orientation comes back into play. So we start with nervous system regulation. We, We need to start with cultivating a comfort zone with a in the realm of feeling less tense, less unsafe. It's not safe and it's not relaxed. Those are, those extremes are usually too, they're too extreme for most people at first, Mm -hmm. right? We have to titrate into this experience of, well, I'm feeling less tense today. I only feel 82% tense and whereas yesterday is 92. Okay. We get into this safety, building this zone of safety and feeling this way and then tapping into internal places where we feel safe within our body so we can get our container ship back that helps the brain feel safe enough to move forward in considering other actions like okay i've got enough capacity to say no today i've got enough capacity to put up a boundary and then execute it things like that and this is always a tandem work we're doing the boundary work and the regulation and soothing, um, even sometimes upregulation, like it's time to get into action rather than in, you know, we got to get out of immobility, um, things like that. So it's, it's a dance that we start to learn in our own rhythms, um, but it's absolutely essential because you don't get out of the freeze fawn loop without addressing your safety at the nervous system, biological level, at the physical level, and at the emotional relational level. There's it's not going to happen unless you address those things. So we focus a lot on that. And I regulate it in different ways, some of the common tools that a lot of people have because of somatic experiencing and some of my own. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let's now, I'm curious of the self-trust piece. So I know, um, yeah, I'm curious, like what, what your definition is self-trust. I mean, in relating it so much from what you shared, it's connected in that, you know, um, you're more internally oriented, right? In terms of your safety and, and your connection versus outsourcing um, to, to everybody's needs and being more hypervigilant uh, in your environment. I'm curious though, what, cause why self-trust first though? Yeah, yeah that's the thing. It's a lot of people are like, why that? Cause we think, and I used to think this, um, self-trust is a result of work, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we take trust based on its common um, approach is a pattern of reliable behavior, mm-hmm. right? Self-trust has two, well, I put it into three components. First, 
for codependence, the first thing we experience is the negation and denial of our experience. So person A does a thing to me. I have a response about that. And person A is like, man, you're selfish. Why are you so upset? I was just joking. What's wrong with you? That's a negation of my internal experience. Now, if this was a parent and I'm a three-year-old, I'm going to be like, something's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be angry that they called me a name. Okay. Now we have introduced self-doubt and self-distrust into the person. And so now we carry this for the rest of our existence. Am I really true? Is this right? Am I seeing that right? Is what I feel valid? Should I have that reaction? So I start with self-trust as a regulator. And the first part of that is we restore self-trust in the legitimacy of our reactions, of our capacity, so that we're not like, oh, I'm supposed to be able to do more. I have got limits. The self-trust in my self-sense. So I can be like, well, my body's giving me a no to this thing. Maybe I can trust that. What's in my awareness? Like something's off here. What is, what is this? And my, my emotions, like I'm feeling this for a valid reason. This is real. And then my lived experience. Oh, well, I went through this because we are gaslit. We are denied. We are dismissed. We are bypassed. And so I start self-trust with legitimacy to counter that programming and restore our fundamental foundation. I call it our first natural state, which is self-trusting our experience, our impulses. And then we move into trusting our natural completeness because, I mean, who here doesn't think they're, who, who, who here thinks they're whole? Most codependents aren't thinking that. They're like, this I'm, I'm incomplete without this person. I'm incomplete without this outcome. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm unworthy of being loved because of X, Y, Z. So we start restoring trust in the legitimacy of our wholeness. And then we restore congruency, which means that your choices and actions become aligned with your intention and your values. That then that's where we get the whole spectrum of trust, self-trust moving. Because now I can trust myself to make better choices and actions based on the legitimacy of my awareness and wholeness. And that's why I start with self-trust as a foundation. Because without that, students and clients and myself, we just wandered too much. I'm like, why are we wandering? Why are we wandering? And I'm like, and that one student, the student that gave it to me, she's all like, I just don't trust it. I don't trust myself. I'm like, that's it. That's it. That's it. So I started doing little tests with students and my community and stuff and shifts started happening. Like that's the piece. And so that's why I start there. And then we build into other areas like restoring safety at a deeper level, um, sanity. So we know what's real, detect our fantasies, pop them, get back to sobriety and then personal sovereignty. That's the foundation of healing codependency. And then we do the more advanced stuff like knowing, loving, and living who you are, and then building relationships where you're seen, loved, and valued for who you are. Yeah, I really love how you've been breaking it down. I love this uh, starting with excavating this, you know, the gaslighting or the, the uh, just becoming the, the beginning, the beginning of what you shared of really um, being more attuned to your experience, like beginning to identify that and trusting that before getting into any other sort of um, any, I like that's the foundation. I love that you just shared that. And I think um, I also really appreciated that you shared um, the wholeness piece, you know, um, the next kind of the next step yeah. in the, the self-trust is knowing that you're worthy, knowing that you're whole, knowing feeling it. It's not just a knowing uh -huh. That's one of our challenges is in, in codependency. We, we, know, we know things. Most of my students have read like 400 books, 10,000 YouTube videos. They're <laughs> experts on this, right? I'm you, I know, I imagine you've done the same thing, right? So it's like, yeah, I've got a, my own library and things. It's 
it's a transition from knowing to being to the feeling of it because nothing shifts unless it shifts in the body. So it's very somatically oriented in that I'm going to feel my value and I'm going to trust the legitimacy of what I feel. And then I can move to trusting it completely because that legitimacy is such a huge part in it. It sounds small, but when we look at the, the tapestry of especially narcissistic abuse, gaslighting, denial, I mean, neglect was like the MO in my family because nobody could, pro there's one feeling you're allowed to have and that's happiness and it's their definition, whatever that is. So that moves around. Um, but getting into that legitimacy, like this is real for me. It's valid for me. Nobody else has to agree. Mm -hmm. It's still real for me. And if someone else doesn't agree that it's real, I have now found a person that doesn't belong in my primary circle because I'm governing my boundaries based on what keeps me in well-being and happiness, not what makes them happy. So it's a really critical, it seems small because it's like, oh, legitimacy, but it's critical to it. Because without that peace in action, the, the person that's attempting to heal from codependency is going to have this big question in the background that's going to undermine their work. Am I doing this right? Is this what I'm supposed to feel? Am I even real? That kind of stuff. So that legitimacy is a critical piece back to being embodied in your, your personhood. So. Mm -hmm. so how would this legitimacy, I mean, how does that usually look like for your, your clients? How, the behaviors that emerge are it's like, I don't like that. So I said, no, mm -hmm. I spoke up and said, this is what I want. Hey, this isn't working for me. Can we do this instead? There's not this self-questioning anymore. There's not a self-doubt running like, should I not want that? Should I? It's more like, this is what I want. Here's how I want it. Can we make that happen? So they become very direct, very clear, and very simple in what they're communicating. That's the biggest result. The other cool result with their legitimacy is they have more peace. They have more confidence. They have more sense of internal safety. And they have this growing resilience towards life. They're like, well, this will suck, but I can handle it. I can deal because I can trust in me and I can trust in my resources. Because they're not just an island to themselves. In self-trust is building resources or interdependency with healthy resources around you. And trusting yourself in that, hey, I can detect healthy people and appropriate resources. I can ask and I'll be cared for the majority of the time. Okay. So legitimacy really shows up as, as a, the interdependent expression of the self rather than the codependent survival strategy. Yeah. The word that keeps coming up is like the congruency piece of how you're thinking and feeling, uh, how it's congruent of how, yeah, you're acting in the world. And congruency is uh, just going to hold a little space for everyone for a moment because it's such a blunt instrument. It's like gravity. Gravity is going to do what gravity does. And if we don't understand what gravity does, we're, we might get hurt, right? Ownership is the same thing. Congruency and ownership. My behaviors, my intentions are aligned. And when they're not, I need to shift the behavior or understand the context and see what needs to change. That requires us to be very deliberate about what we choose and how we execute that choice. So it ends the blame game and it ends the use of shame and guilt in our world and it transfers shame into empathy guilt into remorse and blame into ownership it's like here we are this is our power and we get comfortable with the use of this power and the consequence or results it creates we learn and we learn fast hey did this choice in action get me what i wanted no what do i need to change in this choice in action to get what i want oh this okay but if it did get me what i want now i can realize the reality between cause and effect in my ability to affect my own life. So now I'm not trying to control anybody else. I'm discovering what happens in response to the choices and actions I take. So congruency is, is essential. It's the integrity component. Um, but it's also one of the most 
rewarding and challenging components of the work. Mm -hmm. I, I love how you brought up the shame and guilt because I was going to go there next. If you can maybe just share a little bit about shame and guilt your perspective and in, in relating it to the codependency. I look at shame and guilt as programmed responses. I don't look at them as innate responses. So shame, I was told I should feel shame about a thing by the way, someone reacted to the thing. So if I go to person A and say, Hey, person A, I want pizza with a lot of fish on it. And person A is my God, that's disgusting. What's wrong with you? Then I internalize it as something's wrong with my desire. Then I start to feel shame about it. Right. That's how we're programmed. And same thing with guilt. Oh, I wanted the pink ball. I didn't want to share it with person B. Person B got upset. And then their parent comes over. You're a real selfish child for not sharing your pink ball. Oh, I'm bad. They're, they're, I made a mistake. I should do this. So they're programmed. And the transition here, <laughs> this is this is a little fun. Um, first, shame needs kind of a combination of care. This will sound a little weird, but we also need to kind of distrust our shame. Call it a pivot. If I distrust the legitimacy of my shame, I can get access to the pain I experienced prior to the shame taking a an authoritative role in my relationship to the thing I'm having feelings about. And then I got to bring empathy into the part that's expressing shame. It's an important distinction. The shame doesn't need empathy because it's a program. The part, the aspect of herself, the part of me that goes, that's bad. I'm bad for that. They need love. They need legitimacy. Hey, your need there was valid. I see you. I care about you. And then letting them, that part of yourself, expand on their terms. And explore what life is without the shame. We'll set the shame aside for a bit. What's it look like if we didn't have the shame? Oh, I'd be this way. Okay. Who would you be without the shame in this? I, I'd be doing that. Okay. Now we're starting to understand ourselves. And then they can make choices about who they want to be now. And that usually is enough to dislodge the shame and then resolve it. Because they usually bring it into a safe container where the shame is dissolved by the um, witness of warm, safe others. So when it comes to guilt, guilt's about rules that we've internalized that were not ours. So I like to look at guilt as like, okay, somebody told me I should do something different. What are my values now? What matters to me here? And then start to explore who would I be if I set the guilt aside and operated from those values, giving myself permission to have my own authority again in this topic um, and how I respond to whatever that topic is. Uh, the other thing with guilt is it typically is more blended with shame than not in codependency. Because I find a lot of people, it's like, I feel guilty about that. I'm a bad person. You're really describing shame. So you get a little more nuance and clarity there. And then specifically in relating to other people, I don't I teach students and I've, I've done this for myself. I don't feel shame for an impact I have on a person. I feel remorse or empathy. And the reason why is because shame points the arrow of attention back to me, not to them. And then I am carrying a burden that's not necessary. If someone says, Marshall, you did this, it hurt me. Then my goal is to understand, acknowledge it, and then depending on the context, make a repair. And then that repair has to happen through empathy and remorse, not through, oh, I feel shameful about that. I'm, I'll go you know, do something to myself to, to atone for this. It's more like, I see the impact. What could I do differently that would help you feel more seen and loved? Because that was my intention and it obviously didn't work. So we have this kindness towards ourself because we value and respect our intention, but we also value and respect their impact first and then express our desire for that connection and be open to the shift. And then uh, same thing with guilt. Oh, I'm feeling guilt, which means I really need to either check the rule set. Like, is this a rule that I've agreed with? If it's not, then I can say, hey, this is a boundary I have. It's not something I can agree to. I get the impact. I can see how that impacted you that way. 
um, I can do this or what would work for you differently, but I can't do this over here. So you get into a negotiation with it. But from my perspective, we don't need to carry shame and guilt as ways of correction of towards behavior because it doesn't work. If it did, Brene Brown wouldn't exist, right? <laughs> we, we, a lot of us would be like, really? Wow, I got this down. No, shame and guilt are inhibitors to our growth and they, they inhibit our ability to make effective repair and connection with others. So that's my approach with those. Yeah. Um, wow. So much, so much information that I've been processing and following you and, and a couple of things that I, that's just stuck out for me from what you shared is I, I appreciated you sharing about uh, distrusting the shame, <laughs> the paradox in that, right. In terms of increasing self-trust, a lot of that is distrusting the shame and separating yourself from it yeah. and uh, not listening to that. So. And not I, believing it. And not believing yet. Yeah. yeah Cause so, you're going to hear it. Your brain will give you its programming that, mm -hmm. so you'll hear it, but it's not believing it. It's stripping it of its significance and its authority you've given it. It's like, Mah, that's my shame thought. And when shame thoughts show up, it's a signal that the part behind it that's expressing the thought needs love. It has a need. It's trying to get in some way. Like the inner critic is something I don't, a lot of people are like, get rid of the inner critic, but I'm like, the inner critic is your inner wounded child who has no other way to express that pain. So they adopted the language of the abuser against you. They're just asking for you to care for it. It's a three-year-old that doesn't know what to do with what it feels. So as my parent self, I'm like, oh, okay, you've got pain. And I go through a process called acknowledgement, legitimization, and integration with those emotions. And that tends to like my inner critic is really quiet now. He still speaks up, but I'm, he, he points me to my needs and to, to unresolved pain. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I'm curious if maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on when you, obviously, um, yeah, like not listening to the shame and, and bringing this sense of care and compassion and attunement to your needs underneath the part of you that, uh, possibly you're expressing and shame comes up, right? So how, how do you typically with clients, like, how do you work with that with the shame there? Because I'm curious too, and um, as you continue kind of, not you personally, but like as one continues unraveling, right? And increasing in their own sense of self and self-trust, there's less shame, right? And less, you know, the inner critic, but through that process, what what is unraveling what's getting releasing more of i'm curious well we're releasing emotional association with certain definitions that's mm -hmm. a really technical term right like oh marshall neat <laughs> really what's going on there is i do not feel shame about the thing anymore a part of me might feel that i'll care for it so i've differentiated myself from it. I become an individual from the shame. So I am not shame. I am a person that happens to feel shame sometimes. And the space between this is filled with um, care. And care mm -hmm. is really this um, diligence in our own self boundaries. Like one of my self boundaries is I am not going to use shame against myself. Mm -hmm. And the second one's empathy for myself. Oh, I got pain here. Okay, I'm going to connect with it. I'm going to give it some space. I'm going to let it talk. I'm going to acknowledge it. Hey, you're here. You're real to me. I'm going to legitimize it. You're valid. What you went through makes sense. You're feeling this because of what you've gone through. I'm going to let it integrate, which is the shift I feel when I do that. Like, oh, I can feel less of this now and more of this other thing. Because... <laughs> Part of our challenge in emotional work is understanding that emotions are a language. It's an expression of, of some part of ourself attempting to get a need met. And it usually starts with safety. And then we can <coughs> bring safety into the view, create that container for it. Then it's gonna share its other need. 
Does it need attention? Does it need shelter? Does it need play? Does it need some affection? Does it need some of your time? Does it need rest? Um, does it need to be seen and believed? Things like that. Mm -hmm. So when we do this kind of work, the shame tends to, because the shame is a response, a programmed response, the programming stops and it's like, oh, I'm okay. I can have uh, space and peace with myself. Even though maybe I did something that hurt someone. Yeah, I can empathize with that. And I can see where I can change my behavior. But internally, I'm like, I love me. And maybe I have fear about all that action or pain there. Yeah, of course I do. Because our emotions are, are the expression of this relationship between me and an event. And that event usually happened in the past sometime. And that's what is what I call emotional association. When A happens, feel B, basically. And when those dynamics show up, it's about understanding that I can shift, I can care for that emotion, which shifts that association. Mm -hmm. So I used to feel deep, my, the culture, my family are shame bound. Mm -hmm. Like the word naked was banned in my family, just to give you an idea about the strictness around certain things. Um, when my mother died, I was shamed for grieving her. You, you, you don't grieve. You, you have this person forever. So why are you grieving? You're so selfish. Um, and so when I released the shame around these feelings, I got to feel them and care for them, which changed my emotional association with grief, for instance. It's like, oh, when grief shows up, I'm like, oh, I'm, I miss mom. I'm hurting. I'm right here. And then I'm with me. And then I check in to see if I need additional resourcing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So that's what I'm talking about is we're shifting the relationship we have to our emotions so we can care for the part that's expressing the emotion. And that shifts the emotional programming. So rather than shame or guilt, you feel peace or care or joy or indifference. Like I'm more and more indifferent to people not liking what I do. Well, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, go, go do what you want to do in your yard then. Neat. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. none of my business anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so we get these shifts coming in when we care for our, our emotions. Specifically, I use the approach of acknowledgement, legitimization, and integration, and not as an analytical process, but as a somatic experience of like, I feel seen. This is real. It makes sense because what I feel is a result of what I've been through. It's not a result of a flaw in me. And then, oh, I feel different about it now. Maybe I can trust that a little bit and see where that takes me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. The emotional association. Um, I'm definitely hearing how it's a uh, yeah, if you have a certain trigger, you start relating to it from a different space in this space with yourself that's able to not choose the patterns of like shame and guilt uh, if you've been doing that for so long. And I'm curious though, because um, grief just keeps kind of coming up for me. So I'm wondering in that process with your clients, how, yeah, I mean, what is the relationship with grief in terms of, um, yeah codependency they are intrinsically linked mm -hmm. see if i can keep myself from having a moment <laughs> um healing from codependency is a lot of grieving mm -hmm. because we have to give up our fantasies we have to embrace what's real and that can have a long-term impact because we don't get those things anymore. We didn't even get them to begin with. So we grieve. We grieve a lot. Sometimes in, um, in class, I, I do group support. It's called live mentoring for my course students. Some days it's just us grieving with each other. Mm. Some days it's celebrating. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes we make a big breakthrough and we're celebrating it. And yet there is a cost 
And so I'm very gentle with grief because for me, grief is, is love with no place to land. And so we honor what it was. We honor the fantasies that will never be, the promises that will never be fulfilled, the hopes that we had to kill in order to become free. And the, the cost of people we cared about that we can't have around anymore because they're toxic. Um, and then the collateral shifts of grieving who we were, grieving what cost it brought to us personally, like what I did and didn't do to others to get things done. Um, very caring, very kind with our grief. Because uh, Grief, it's a paradoxical process because it's like fire in a forest. It cleans and it allows a renewal to have space to enter. It isn't the renewal, but it's the one that creates the space for that renewal. So as we follow our grief, we find ourselves evolving into a different sense of self that has more capacity more grounding, more availability, and more clarity. From there, we can create things that really matter to us um, very deliberately. So grief and codependency are intrinsic. That they, they are almost a hand in glove experience. You will grieve as you heal. You have to, because you've lost things and those things matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing the depth of it and, and really normalizing how much grief is involved in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a process for us. It's, it's a common one I reference, especially in the foundation work I do with self-trust and restoring safety, sanity, and sovereignty. <laughs> grief is in almost every, I, I mention it frequently. I'm like, we might grieve here today. Let us where we're here to hold space with that grief and give it care. Mm -hmm. So there's so much that we, that you've been able to share and I want to keep on asking you questions, but we're kind of getting close towards the end. Um, so I wanted to, before I have you share with listeners, your offerings and where they can find you, if you would just like to anything last that you'd like to leave listeners with and just kind of recapping about codependency and self-trust mm -hmm. yeah first of all can how do i put this to my students I always have this if you could would you open up to the idea that codependency is just about survival open up can open up to considering that consider opening up to i've just been trying to survive this isn't anything I have to carry shame about, number one. Number two, consider trusting that the reactions you have in your body to whatever you've heard today or what you might be going through in your life right now, they are all fundamentally innately legitimate. They may not make sense to you. You might feel shame and guilt and question around them. That's okay. They're still legitimate. Consider trusting their legitimacy just a bit more and see what shifts for you. That's where we start. So that that's what I would say is you're sane and what you're going through is real. Hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. one thing everybody needs. To, I mean, I say it all the time. <laughs> I say it to myself, when well, we're feeling real. This is all valid. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. One <laughs> you <laughs> my mind lines is like there's nothing wrong with you um what you're feeling is what you is due to what you've gone through not because there's a problem with you mm -hmm. so that's really yeah that validation is so critical mm -hmm. so uh your offerings like i would love to hear about them for listeners and i i'll be sure to put it on the the podcast bio listeners if you're you know wanting to actually uh, follow his links, but I would yeah. love for you to share how, how uh, clients can work with you. So my, um, you can visit me at free the self.com. So that's my website. And there's a couple of ways we have 
what's called the community, which is a free online community on Facebook where you can get guidance, tools, and support. I'm interactive in the group. I respond to posts. I make posts, videos, all that stuff. Second thing is getting the self-trust guide. So I have a guide called the Restoring Self-Trust Guide. And that's going to take you through understanding, first of all, what codependency is, those three necessities we talked about, the phone response, and giving you your first tool in restoring legitimacy, which is the um, restoring the legitimacy in the in your reactions. So you get that. And the second one I'd encourage people to get is to join my five-day Freedom from Codependency workshop. We start, I do this several times a year, but the current one coming up um, is March 28th. And that's also linked to, they're both on the front page. You can get them right there. And in the five-day workshop, I'm going to give you the four essential practices codependents need in order to heal. And the first one's soothing the nervous system. So you get a little more space, a little more freedom, a little more relaxation, or at least less tense. The second one is to go deeper on building that self-trust, what self-trust is, how we implement it. Third one is befriending your emotions and your lived experience. And the fourth one is reclaiming your innate value. So when you start restoring your sense of sovereignty and identity. And then on day five, we talk about how we implement these things and then what your appropriate next step is, whether it's, hey, I need to find a therapist. Hey, Marshall, I want to join you in your courses like the Happiness After Codependency System or the Codependency Healing Essentials Trainings, or um, you know, what else do I need in order to resource my healing? So my goal is to help people get where they need to be so they can heal that and these are the two resources where I recommend people start is the self trust, uh, restoring self trust guide, and then the five day freedom from codependency workshop. Thank you for sharing that. Those are some beautiful offerings. I really appreciated you coming on again. There was so much more I wanted to ask you, but I'm just grateful you were able to come on and and yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you for having me. And we definitely should do more in the future, and we can just we can like focus on one thing and go deep on it. And yeah, we have lots of fun. Yeah. I would love to invite you back on actually too. I would love for you to probably come back on uh, talking about the happiness piece, right? I loved yeah. the happy codependency. So what, yeah. What more life looks like when to kind of be able for listen- beyond it. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of my listeners, they're, you know, high performers who, mm just struggle with a lot of shame and, and, um, imposter syndrome oh, and yeah. burnout and just pushing themselves. So codependency. Yeah, this is definitely an important topic. So thank you once again, Marshall, for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>